Good morning. Uh, today's sermon I borrowed from Pastor Paul. It's the pressure of fatherhood. So let's get started. Uh, a small boy said, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much on the gift. Bill Cosby wrote, Now that my father is a grandfather, he just can't wait to give money to my kids. And when I was a kid and I asked him for 50 cents, <clears throat> he would tell me the story of his life. How he got up at 5 a.m. when he was 70 years old and walked 23 miles to milk 90 cows. And the farmer for whom he worked had no bucket. So he had to squirt the milk into his little hand and then walk eight miles to the nearest can. All for 50 cents. The result was I never got my 50 cents. But now he tells my children every time he comes into the house, well, let's see how much money old granddad has for his wonderful grandkids. And the minute they take money out of his hands, I can call them over to me and I snatch it away from them because that is my money. Someone wrote these humorous words entitled, The World According to Dad. These are words that, the, that most dads have said at some time or another to their children. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Quiet, I'm watching the ball game. Don't forget to check the oil. Bring back all the change. How should I know? Ask your mother. I'm not made of money. When I was your age, I walked five miles to and from school each day, and it was uphill both ways. You are going and you will have fun. Who's paying the bills around here anyway? If you break your leg, don't come running to me. Don't put your feet on the furniture. Your mother will kill you. Get down before you kill yourself. On second thought, go ahead. Quit playing with your food. Be quiet. Can't you see I'm trying to think? Why? Because I said so. If you don't quit that, I'm going to call your mother. You better get that junk picked up before your mother comes in here. Just wait till you have kids of your own. I was not asleep. I was just resting my eyes. We who are fathers could probably add a couple of quotes to this list. Being a parent and a father can be an interesting and trying experience. Someone said parents spend the first part of the child's life urging him to talk and walk, and the rest of his childhood telling him to sit down and keep quiet. One father said to his teenage son, do you mind if I use the car tonight? I'm taking your mother out to eat and I would like to impress her. Father said to his daughter, what's wrong, Judy? Usually you talk on the phone for hours. This time you only talk for 30 minutes. How come? Judy replied, it was the wrong number. A letter from a college student to his parents read, please send food packages. All they serve here is breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And there's a Father's Day card that reads, Dad, everything I ever learned, I learned from you, except one thing. The family car really will do 110. It is stressful to be a father today. Some fathers have jobs that require 55 to 60 hours a week, and they feel guilty that they don't spend enough time with their children. The redefining of gender roles has left many dads uncertain about what is expected of them. The breakdown of morality also creates stress. How can we get our children to adhere to Christian morals when they are attacked every day? The TV portrayal of fathers as inept and irrelevant uh, has, hasn't eased the tension either. Sometimes at church we add to the pressure by beating up on dads for their neglect or poor examples. One little boy said to his preacher, Boy, that was a good sermon. My dad slumped way down today. It's not the intent of this message to beat fathers up, but to build them up. Let's look at a father in the book of Genesis who faced some similar pressures. His name is Jacob. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun, and Jacob experienced many of the pressures that fathers face today. Fathers face pressure from the failures of their past. First, there was the pressure of Jacob's imperfection. Jacob did not have a good reputation as a young man. One day in his youth, he was out barbecuing some beef stew when his older twin brother, Asao, came in from an unsuccessful hunt. Famished and starving, the aroma from, the, from that stew cooking smelled great to a hungry hunter, and Asao begged for a portion. Jacob said, I'll give you some, but it will cost you your birthright. Asal said, what good is a birthright if a man dies of starvation? Jacob had his deal, but it was a raw deal. 
Sometime later, Jacob cheated a sow again, this time out of his inheritance. It was custom that the older son would receive a double portion of the father's estate when the father died. So Jacob, with his mother's help, disguised himself as his older brother and manipulated his blind father into guaranteeing him the inheritance. That would be the equivalent of signing the will under pressure today. When Asal learned <coughs> about that, he was furious. He vowed that he would kill his brother when his dad died, and then Asal would get it all. So Jacob fled for his life. Jacob's reputation in the land of Canaan was one of the schemer, a con man, somebody not to be trusted. That's the kind of reputation most fathers want to prevent their children from learning about. Jacob did not have an untarnished reputation, and the sons knew about it. Most of you know some things about your dad that were imperfect. Maybe he was prejudiced, or greedy, or a heavy drinker, or a womanizer. Maybe when you first discovered those things, you were disillusioned. Your confidence was shaken. But be realistic. There's no perfect father. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't have an unrealistic standard. Be forgiving. The Bible says we're to forgive one another as we want God to forgive us, so extend some grace. Remember, you don't have to repeat the offenses of your father. My dad was not at all affectionate around my mother or anybody else. If I'm not careful, I tend to be the same way. So I've worked to change that. You don't have to be like your dad. You can profit from his mistakes. So love him in spite of inadequacies. Fathers face the pressure of trying to be a positive influence at home. The greatest pressure Jacob may have faced was that of trying to be a positive influence in his home. Even Jacob was imperfect. He tried to be a spiritual leader to his family. <clears throat> Even though he was an old man and his sons were grown, Jacob called all 12 of his sons and he blessed them individually. He said, Reuben, you're going to excel in power and honor. Judah, your brothers are going to praise you and your enemies are going to be conquered by you. Dan, you are going to provide justice to people. Asher, your food is going to be rich. One by one, he blesses children with all the imperfections in this family. These 12 sons became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. Christian fathers feel a lot of pressure to be a spiritual influence on their children, and that's hard because we worry about drugs and guns in school and teen pregnancy and AIDS and youth suicides and all those things that are countering the values that we want to impart. Gary Smalley wrote a book called The Blessing in which he encouraged modern fathers to pass a spiritual blessing to their children. He said that it's more than taking them to church or praying with them or setting a good example. He talks about five practical ways to pass on a blessing. Number one is a meaningful touch. Jacob embraced and kissed and laid his hands on his sons and grandchildren by giving a hug or a touch or an arm around the shoulder or a Dutch rub or butterfly kisses. We communicate love and a blessing. Second, Smalley says we pass on a blessing through verbal affirmation. Children long to hear their dad say, I'm proud of you. You've done that well. I love you. That's something few people uh, don't hear as a child. Third, we pass along a blessing by attaching value. To bless means to honor. We honor our children by letting them know that they are valuable to us. They're the most important people in the world to us. That means we sacrifice time for them. That means we look them in the eye when we talk to them, and we stop and we listen to them. The fourth way we pass along a blessing is by picturing a positive future for them. Jacob pronounced the positive future on Reuben and Judah and Dan and Asher and all the others. We can bless our children by attaching high value to their gifts and then picturing for them a positive future. You really love people. You make a great sales, 
you'd make a great salesman someday. The way you love animals, you'd be a good veterinarian. You want to be a policeman, that means you're courageous. The way you love church, you're going to be a great church leader someday. The fifth way that Gary Smalley says we bless our children is by an act of commitment. It's not enough to speak the words, there has to be willingness and the parent to sacrifice for the child to pray, to spend time in helping develop their gifts, to spend money for lessons and for higher education. To be honest, many men find it difficult to do some of those things and to verbalize how they're feeling and to pass along a blessing. Mom, you can sometimes help dad do that by communicating what he says to you in private about the kids. You can say to one of your kids, you know what your dad said about you last night? He said, I think that's the smartest girl I've ever seen. Or you should have seen the look on your dad's face when he walked up on that platform. Or when you got that hit, he was, be he was beaming. His buttons were going to pop. He is so proud of you. Kids, if your dad does something right, tell him. He'll act like it's nothing. But I'll guarantee you, he'll remember it the rest of his life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the time you have given us to worship you. I ask you to watch over this congregation, especially Paul, as he continues to heal. Be with us as we go into our week. In your holy name, amen. I, as some of you might not know me, I'm Carlene Newsom. I'm Sandy Holly's daughter and Whitney's mom. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. I grew up in this church, and when I was about nine years old, I was baptized up here. And then when I was about 20, in my early 20s, I uh, rededicated my life over here. But anyway, this church has always been very special to me. And um, when, about 16 years ago, I moved to a different town and started attending church there, and I transferred my membership at that time. Um, and then since then, I've moved to another town about three hours away, and I'm attending a church there, and I'm involved in a Bible study, and I'm involved in some of their events. Um, but my heart is here at this church. And so I was talking to Pastor Paul, and I asked him, because I, I, I was thinking, you know, should I transfer my membership to the new church and where I live? And uh, I said, Pastor Paul, would it be weird if I wanted to transfer my membership back to Lindsay Christian Church? Because this is where my heart is. I love all of you people. And um, I, I watch their services every, every week on YouTube. Thank goodness for that. I'm very grateful you have that service. Um, I attend every time I come here. I pray daily for the church. I support the church. And so anyway, I asked Pastor Paul, would that be weird? And he said, no, not at all. So today I would like to reestablish my membership here at Lindsay Christian Church. I don't have much to add to that, but um, we're so grateful for you. You're such a, a wonderful lady. You've always been very special to me. Um, you always have kind words, and I know you love the Lord. So welcome back. Thank you. I guess Ted didn't get to come today, so... I'll read through my deliverer for us to do communion. If you want to follow along with the insert in your bulletin. How do you respond when you face difficulties, dangers, or disease? What would you do if you were canceled or faced persecution because of your faith in Jesus? We can relate to King David who underwent many hardships and enemies. Yet he chose to praise God, trusting the Lord to deliver him again and again. He wrote, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. That's from Psalm 18, 1 and 2. What word stands out to you in this passage? It might be strength, God is our source of power. Or it might be rock, he is the firm foundation we can trust. Or fortress, 
a strong tower of protection? Or is it deliverer, a picture of Jesus as our Messiah? Or shield, a protective weapon to ward off the enemy's attacks? Or horn of salvation, a symbol of power and victory? Or stronghold, another place of protection? All those words are good and faithful as we count the costs of following Jesus. But one word in this passage is hiding in plain sight, and it may be the preeminent word in this passage. The word is my. My strength, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my shield, my salvation, my stronghold. This is personal for David, and it's personal for each of us as well. Jesus is the true rock, my rock, who became the chief cornerstone of the church. He is my deliverer and my salvation. He delivered us and saved us at the cross. Don't forget that what Jesus did at the cross was and is very personal for each of us. He is my deliverer. He is my savior. He gave up his body represented by the blood, by the bread, sorry, on the cross for me and you. And he shed his blood represented by the cup to deliver us from death and give us eternal life. So thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for sacrificing your body and blood so that I can be in relationship and communion with my Father. Let's take communion together. So again, his body represented by the bread and his blood represented by the cup. Shall we pray? Thank you, Jesus, for dying for each and every one of us while we were still sinners. Thank you for caring enough about us to endure the pain of the cross. And thank you that we have the hope of eternal life with you now. In your son's name we pray. Amen.